I'm Kadambri Ragukumar, and I've called Aotearoa New Zealand home for about 15 years now. One of the many things that I love about this place is the thriving art scene. But in 2021, I want to get to know more artists who represent people like myself. Where I'm at with my journey is to try to give graffiti and street art new context, new places for it to live and breathe. I moved to Auckland in 2006 and was really interested in the city's graffiti scene. I remember seeing this tag called Burst and I only recently found out that it belonged to Bobby Hung. We're very fortunate to live in a place like New Zealand where, you know, the place is really culturally diverse. And having grown up here and being raised by Chinese parents, you know, what I've kind of experienced is seeing what I see on the street. And that's really what has led me on to this kind of journey of painting graffiti. Graffiti is sneaky. Done when people think nobody is watching. I can't see the fun or honesty in that. If we look at the kind of roots of graffiti, what it is is really about getting your name out there, getting famous, getting notoriety, and getting respect from your peers, and all of these sorts of things. And, and that's still at the core what it is. And I was probably only like 15, 16 when I first started graffiti, at least at high school. I wasn't really good at something academic or sports or something like that. I don't know, it made me felt famous or something, you know, at least within you know, my group of friends. It's kind of like a sense of affirmation, you know, like of being accepted or something like that. And then that kind of set me on that trajectory and then probably took me about two or three years before I actually, you know, tried to do more than just the tagging. Probably around 18, 19 years old, yeah, started to attempt painting pieces, which is the more colorful kind of uh, graffiti lettering. At that time as well, on Sundays, the trains wouldn't run. You know, this is back in the early 2000s. And so it basically became, you know, on every Sunday you could walk along the train lines and it was like a public art gallery. That's really what it was. And there was a kind of gangster type edge to it, you know, like if you painted over someone, someone's probably going to beat you up or people might take your paint. And it was quite a hostile scene. Whereas what I've been trying to do over the past five, ten years has been to create a more of a collective community, you know, where people are kind of working together, you know, to express themselves, you know, and, and find different ways of, of working than, than it was previously. I've really had to take on a, you know, almost like a guardianship type, you know, kaitiakitanga kind of role to lead some of the scene because graffiti, at least at its core, is a really young person's game. And so there's a lot of kind of macho-ness, masculinity, like, that kind of comes with that. So yeah, I'm trying to just re-channel some of that energy to kind of connect all of us together and reframe the kind of discourse of how we see graffiti. For me, I think, is just to find different places to put graffiti and challenge the way that people can see the work, you know, and, you know, a museum is a, obviously a great example to go do that. I'm at the Dow's museum today where the TMD crew have put up this massive show that encapsulates 20 years of graffiti in Aotearoa. There is something that is, you know, to me, uh, very important about these images, you know, because yep. they're a collection of art history. I would say that 99% of it, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. What you kind of witness as well, I guess, um, with some of the photos, is you see the, the changing of Auckland, you know, the yep. context of Auckland, you know. Yeah, it's the whole gentrification. It's a documentation exactly about right. gentrification has changed. Exactly right. Colour in. Left, right, left, right. With some of the community work that I do, a lot of the focus is really on engaging young people. And often I run quite a lot of graffiti battles and workshops out there. And so with the workshops, that's really centered around kind of upskilling, you know, some of the young people with the skills in graffiti so that it kind of sets them up to be able to, you know, go beyond the, the kind of just the tagging. And also what I've been doing for quite a while now is projects, you know, with high schools. So. Every now and again, I'll, I'll be invited to go do some community projects uh, inside the schools where we're painting basically a collaborative mural with some of the students. Uh, so then I'll kind of take them through the design process and, and learn how to go from paper, you know, sketching up the ideas and conceptualization to actually painting it, you know, on the wall. 
I don't actually think I have the makings of a graffiti artist in me, but under the able guidance of Bobby, some confidence can be feigned. You don't have to push down necessarily like as hard as you can. If you push it too soft, you'll get right. the spitty. If you push it too hard, you'll get this kind runny. of like drippy, yeah. runny texture, which is what we don't want. Oh, you're doing a great job. Really? You're just saying that because yeah, the camera's no, rolling. Yeah, no, it's good. Am I part of the crew now? <laughs> please. <laughs> Maybe please a couple more yes. pieces first. <laughs> Well, that ended short and messy, but at least I got pictures with this PhD holder and graffiti guru. I can relate to how Bobby thrives in culturally diverse environments. And as an academic, he's seeing a whole bunch of that. My main job, you know, besides the art, is actually in teaching and teaching at tertiary level in art and design. And so, you know, what comes with that is having an understanding of this kind of Western perspective of art and design, but then also a, a Māori perspective, you know. So for me, yeah, understanding that kind of New Zealand identity and, you know, where I fit into it, especially as a teacher and then teaching other people, which is an incredibly culturally diverse classroom, that that's an interesting kind of space for me to be in. You can do that. And you probably need to put a little bit more paint. So my vision is really, once again, about legitimizing graffiti and creating opportunities for people, you know, to consider this as a potential career path. Because when I first started, I would have never thought of the idea of being a graffiti artist as almost like a profession, you know? And I would say that probably half of my crew that I'm a part of, which is TMD, are full-time artists. They're making a living from doing this stuff. And so, to me, they have kind of created the blueprints, you know, for me to follow, but then also, while I'm kind of doing everything I'm doing, I'm trying to create some blueprints for future generations to follow. being able to articulate who you are on your own terms. I think it's really empowering. I've been following Carrie ann Lee's work for a number of years now, and when the chance came to meet her in person at the Auckland Zine Fest, I couldn't pass it up. My parents and grandparents have been part of owning and operating some of the first Chinese restaurants and takeaways in Wellington since the 19, late 1940s. The Gold Coin Cafe was where it started for me. My parents bought this business in 1978, just before I was born, in Upper Willow Street in Tiaro. So my parents had it from 1978 to 86. Yeah, go to the shop after school, hang out at the back, do our homework, like where the like boxes and fridge freezers were and watch after school TV. Yeah, that kind of stuff, like total like shop kids. Yeah, I think I really respected the amount of trust that my parents offered me when I was growing up and room to grow and find out who I would be. I think fortunate for me in Wellington, everything seemed really close by and at hand. That was a really lovely thing to discover in terms of like an after school pursuit going into town. Yeah, just noticing what was around at the time in the 90s was really neat. There was a local comic book shop, Comics Compulsion, which I think a lot of people went to. And that was kind of a hub for lots of different people from comic artists to teenagers, punks. So that was really interesting for me, just getting into underground comics and through that underground comic fanzines. And that what struck me from that very young age was that people could kind of make stuff from scratch and have it really impactful and good. So I thought that was a really cool thing to encounter. So for me, that first moment was really inspiring and my relationship with punk has evolved over different years, different forms of relationships with aesthetics, politics, and also community. I think that's really what, if anything, would strip it all back to. It's around the people and how we all sort of spend that time together. 
kind of growing up and trying to work out our articulation about the world. I think also being yourself, being able to come in genuinely as you are and yeah, being Cantonese, Chinese, being a minority, like generally coming into a space, really being okay to own that and celebrate that and be supported in that, it was a really good thing. Carrie Ann is like an institution in herself, from creating collages to the vast research over the years, designing and curating through Red Letter Distro, to collecting and disseminating zines from all around the world, from here in Aotearoa. You kind of actually, you know, it's not just about you, clearly, is it? You oh. sort of really like being able to bring everyone that you collaborate with together. Yeah, That's I think cool. in this space with Red Letter, it's very much, yeah, thinking about myself in context of, yeah, my communities and, yeah, the people around me. I think yeah. because I end up doing a lot of sort of personal work in terms of gallery work, exhibitions, residencies, yeah, for me, I feel like this sort of balances things out in a lot of ways for me to be able to, yeah, come out and see what else is happening. Zines by nature are sort of they try and hold ground in the periphery. It's a really fascinating thing because they're mainstream now and they've always been this all-comers medium where people from all different types of backgrounds are encouraged to come through and yeah, adopt it as a form to get their expressions, their voices, their artwork into print, which I've always respected and value about the medium. Yeah, and that's the cool thing. It's, it can be as personal or social as you need it to be can be serious, silly, sublime, you know, heartbreaking, you know, hilarious. You know, there's no rules and that's kind of, that's really lovely. So, so one of the few places that we can kind of have that level of freedom. But I always think, well, who's missing from this picture? That's always like something else, you know, who, which other communities are not getting access to this and why and what else could be done. I think for me I'm always looking out for things that are yeah really unexpected in terms of publishing and also who the material is reaching out for. It's a medium that's ripe for so many more voices and more stories to come out. You know, even within the Asian now terror arts space we have emerging voices coming through and in, in projects uh, like the Migrant Zine Collective and yeah, having people kind of come through and there's been a proliferation of te reo Māori publications. There's certain things that are still starting to sort of rumble and come up. And I think, yeah, that's really exciting for me to see, I think, people kind of, yeah, using the form in that way. And from Dunedin at the design school and... I have to admit, I admire how Carrie Ann navigates across cultures through the zine medium. And I guess that's the beauty of the plurality that's so foundational to zine culture. Like a lot of people get freaked out and run away <laughs> or avoid um, working cross culturally. People are, are scared to be ashamed to get it wrong or that they're going to offend somebody. And for me is that space between cultural frames is a really precarious place to work. It's messy, it's fraught, there will be mistakes. Uh, at the same time, that's where we are, I think. There's a lot of that um, plurality and inclusivity that I grew up with that I was really interested in. And to try and make sense of that seemed like a natural thing for me. Yeah, just thinking about how that's matured into a point where we have a lot of young and new and emerging voices coming up going, wow, okay, no, we've got, we want something else from this, it's evolved again. It's really quite wonderful. It's not just about making pretty clothes for me. That wouldn't be interesting enough. Natasha comes from the same place as I do in India, Goa. There's not many of us in Auckland, let alone fashion designers from Goa. So naturally, I wanted to get to know her story. 
India is definitely a society where when I was growing up, you didn't talk about anything. You don't talk about sexuality, you don't talk about racism, discrimination, the class system, anything. Like, you know, it's very much, um, you just get on with it because that's just life. I would feel so uncomfortable leaving the house. I would always carry like a gigantic scarf with me and like try to cover up like my boobs and be like, like change my posture so that you don't see any curves. And cause you know, you get cat called even when you're that young, you just feel like unsafe in your body essentially. And I hated that feeling so much. And I wanted to like take back that power in a way. Once I started getting into my teenage years, I just like switched. I was very rebellious. I was very outspoken. And I felt like genuinely just angry when I was faced with things like that. So you got these pants on you, and then I'll grab your top as well. The reason I didn't go after fashion for a really long time is because I had like that typical immigrant guilt of like, I should be a social worker or a doctor, or like, you know, find some way of like, giving back that's more um, noble or, and I always looked at fashion as kind of like maybe too fickle. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to kind of ignore it. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and was kind of in denial. And when I told my friends that I was going to start the brand, they were like, yeah, obviously. And I was like, oh, wish you had said something earlier. Like it wasn't obvious to me because I was sort of denying it so hard. And I just wanted to straighten up. When I decided to do it, I was like, I'm gonna give myself six months, see how it goes. And if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, I'll let it go. No, I'm just so used to making like overcomplicated shit. People are like, is this the neck? Is this the arm? I don't know. And I think a lot of my friends and like people that I care about belong to sort of like communities or minorities that you feel very self-conscious about yourself and you worry about your safety and whether there are threats coming your way just in everyday life. And so I think you either try to hide yourself and shy away so you make yourself invisible or you can kind of own it. I feel like I wanted to just create this like safe little space where people were able to do that and just um, create pieces that allow other people to experience that as well. So it's just like really driven by a sense of freedom and a sense of like expression and doing it in a way that makes you have to own everything about yourself because they're not for the faint hearted. Like if you wear it, you are going to be noticed. Radical inclusivity is a concept that her brand is pretty solidly trying to embody. Not easy when you're up against mainstream fashion. I think the non-binary aspect, like in my eyes, I think all brands are non-binary, even if they label themselves as women's wear or men's wear, because you can be making women's wear and call it that and then exclude people or just say that it's open to whoever wants to wear it. That's as simple as it is. Currently and like over the last couple of years, it became one of those unfortunate things that becomes like a trend that people care about for a little short amount of time. So hopefully it doesn't remain just that, like a trend and people actually just encourage conversations around it and explain themselves when they do make that decision to create clothing that they open up to everyone, which everybody should. There's a lot of brands who go overseas, go to India, for example, and get things made. And they're like, we're paying them three times their normal salary. And like there's this whole like white savior thing around it. Yeah, I definitely get a little bit annoyed when I see that with people going overseas and being like, look at us with our garment workers and like look at their faces and they're all smiling, they're so happy. If you're paying them three times what they got paid before, I'm pretty sure you're still paying not a lot compared to what you would be paying here, which is fine, but like the whole selling it as some great charitable act is just bullshit. And also in terms of design, I try to create pieces that you're not just gonna chuck in the bin after a couple of wears. Like, so I try to avoid like trends with me making clothes. It always starts with the material, seeing what it wants to do, trying to push it to its limit, trying to work with it a little bit, you know, this whole back and forth with it. And it's very like tactile, like through feeling it, through like just trying to see how it moves, its texture. Um, that's definitely like the beginning point for me. This is one of the things that I saw that you had in front of that sort of yeah, almost apron looking dress yeah, yeah, with yeah. a panel in the front. That's right, so the, the way I did that was I just like pinned it onto myself, yeah. started draping it, folding it, pinned it, 
sewed it and then attached it to a separate piece of fabric once I figured out what kind of form I wanted it to be on. Um, right. Yeah, so it's actually quite impromptu, isn't it? A yeah, lot it's, of, uh, it's the pinning super. Work. It's just super intuitive. It's a bit like royalty in this fabric. It's, it's a okay, nice fabric, yeah. Nice. yeah. Nice Actually, I think it's pretty tacky. Mm. Like, it's very kitschy. Yeah. Um, so, okay. obviously, I like it. Every color that I use is, like, kind of purposeful as well. Yeah. So, I don't, I don't really compromise on that. Challenges, yep, she faces a few, but she's not about to back down. I definitely don't go to events anymore. I'll just say that. <laughs> it's like there's a lot of a lot about the fashion community that I love. They're they're warm. There are a lot of people who are like so generous with their time and amazing mentors. And then there's others where they just genuinely make me ashamed to be part of the industry because they're so bitchy. Like I can't. It's just so catty, so narcissistic, so self-absorbed and the last time I tried to get involved, there was a guy who was like, he saying like, oh, I'm so surprised you don't have a sugar daddy. Like, that's what you need to do to get by in this industry. I was like, are you joking? Get away from me. Like, honestly, like, why do you have to like represent us like this? We're like, not all like this, you know? <laughs> I love everything about this. People do ask me the question a lot about whether I see myself as a fashion designer or an artist, and I'm not really fussed about what I'm called or what people see me as. I don't care, like it's about making something, that, that's the joy of it, right? Like making something intuitively without thinking and then coming up with something that you're happy with.